showing up and for helping us hold the space, sacred space for community and mutual support. Today we take a look at the polarization in our society that is seemingly pulling us in two different directions, endangering our common bond as one people and one nation. How can we hold it together when we have so many differing opinions and varied interests while at the same time trying to make it through an ongoing pandemic. Incivility and anger are two of the predominant traits of these stressful times. The title of today's service offers a different suggestion, Times of Compassion. Again, thank you for joining us and spending part of your day right here. Liberation begins with emptying the mind of preconceptions and allowing spaciousness to occur. In this spaciousness, empty of confusion and illusion, comes clarity, insight, and new space for possibility. We light the chalice today as a reminder of this inner spaciousness, this luminosity and shining that we are. On good days, and on bad days alike, we are still it. Even when we don't feel like it, even when we forget, and even when we act just the opposite, we are still it. As this small light illuminates the surrounding space, may our lives illuminate the world. For our moment of centering silence, let us pause, step back from our meandering mind, and allow what is here to be here. No thinking right now, just taking note of this moment, the breath, this space, simplicity, and the sound of the chime. With the first weeks of November, most of the Canadian geese in the area have made their exit to warmer regions south. As I stack wood and do my chores, the geese overhead are part of a familiar routine. Sometimes they're heading north, sometimes they're heading south, but by November, they are all heading south. Opening words this morning include geese and are written by poet Wendell Berry. He speaks of their behavior as a fine model for we humans. What we need is here. Geese appear high over us, pass, and the sky closes behind them. Abandon, as in love or sleep, holds them to their way, clear in the ancient faith. What we need is here. And we pray, not for a new earth or a new heaven, but 
but to be quiet in heart and in eye clear. What we need is right here. When we share our sorrow, our suffering is halved. When we share our joy, our happiness is doubled. It's better to go through this world with its challenges together than to go through it alone. We are one, yet separate, sharing this life together. Let us light candles of joys and concern as we continue this journey. One night last week, I was walking from the house down to the river, and I was looking up in the sky as I walked, and I saw a falling star directly overhead moving away from me. Uh, I was looking right at it when it fell. Usually you catch a glimpse of a falling star in the corner of your eye, or just see the last part of its trail. This was the first time I had ever seen one square in my vision. I light this candle for falling stars on a cold fall night. The United Nations Climate Conference, COP26, met earlier this week in Glasgow, Scotland. Many environmental groups were also there, making their voices heard. Uh, Extinction Rebellion from England is one such group, and had this to say. We accuse world leaders of slow action and failure, and with a daring vision of hope, we demand the impossible. We will sing and dance and lock arms against despair and remind the world there is so much worth working for. The highest recorded temperature on the planet occurred this year, 130 degrees in Death Valley, in the United States, 129.2 degrees uh, recorded in Iran. We light this candle for the climate work that needs to be done, that lies ahead of us. COVID-19 deaths in the United States reached 750,000 this week. So if we light this candle for those who have died. We light this candle to remember. And we're lighting a silent candle this morning any unspoken concerns and prayers that you may have. For those of you at home, uh, use this space to make a mental list of who you want to bring into this space this morning uh, for this positive energy from our group for healing, uh, to bring awareness to where there is suffering uh, that you're aware of. I'll say a prayer in just a moment. Those concerns and names mentioned this morning, we hold them in the light of love and compassion. May our group energy benefit all beings far and wide. May our own minds be renewed and restored to a positive and healing state. Blessed are we all on this day. Amen and blessed be.
One of my favorite comedians is Stephen Wright, born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a big Boston Red Sox fan, uh, known for his lethargic, deadpan delivery. And how he often takes an idea and turns it both ways for humor. For example, I have an answering machine in my car. It says I'm home right now, but leave a message and I'll call when I'm out. Or for my birthday, I got a humidifier and a dehumidifier. I put them in the same room and let them fight it out. <laughs> the current climate in our country, polarization and partisanship, feels like a humidifier and a dehumidifier going at it day in and day out with no end in sight. We have become a nation of two sides, two parties, two approaches to everything, and the distance between the two has not been this large in quite some time. There's tension between the two. There are certainly disagreements between the two. But what concerns me the most is the animosity, the derision, and the hostility that is evident sometimes as an undercurrent, but more and more openly expressed in the interaction between the two. The shrill tenor of a conversation between one side and the other is a concerning indicator of a rift. Here's an excerpt from my writer's blog in the fall of 2020 during our last presidential election, noting our current situation. Since we just had an election this past week, it seems as timely now as it did a year ago. Every American election has its share of unabashed misinformation and personal diatribes. But I think even Hunter S. Thompson would be shocked at the foul level of fear and loathing on the campaign trail of 2020. And that's saying something. It's not just the noise and the vitriol of the exchange, but the exaggeration of extremes that is leading to a political chasm that endangers the very stability of our democratic process. And once you start to frame your arguments in a good guy versus bad guy, or good versus evil manner, then a sinister line indeed has been crossed. What kind of an option is that for a voter? If you label the opposition as a danger to society, it makes the next step towards violence that much easier to rationalize. The language that we use in political discourse and campaigns is crucial to a civil outcome, no matter who wins. Policy ideas and constructive legislation often get lost in a scuffle of party politics and clever diversions when the positive tenor of our communication is ignored. Language is the tool of a statesperson, and its responsible usage can be a game changer for the good of all, while reckless and irresponsible speech is a harbinger of bitter results and leaves a foul taste in everyone's mouth. And in polarized times such as ours, Inflammatory language simply adds a dangerous accelerant to an already incendiary situation. We must choose our words carefully when the stakes are high. And right now, the stakes have never felt higher. We are currently contending with a global health pandemic, racial injustice, unprecedented income inequality, a national health care crisis, gun violence, and complications from climate change. And that's just a short list. There are no easy or obvious answers to any of these issues, and it will require a vigorous and visionary electorate, along with principled elected officials, to guide the process. We are all in this democratic experiment together, and it will take each of us exercising our vote and speaking our civil voice to bring it to be. I must admit that it is difficult not to get caught in this two-sided dynamic of red and blue, left and right, my side, 
your side. Whatever side we tend to lean toward, we inevitably lean away from the other. If we are not careful, or if we are not sufficiently self-aware, the space between the two differing points can be filled with frustration, anger, disrespect, and ill will. The first step in dealing with polarization is the awareness that these negative qualities endanger both our own mental and spiritual condition as well as the individual or individuals of a polar opposite position. How we proceed is dependent upon this first step of self-awareness evaluation. What I am about to propose for step two may not sound practical, and you may disagree with its effectiveness, but here it is anyways. Step two, love everybody and love everything. I know this may sound a bit naive, <coughs> hoping for something uh, more profound, but let me assure you this is more effective than you might first expect. This is the approach and highest teaching of the great world religions. Universal love, patience, inclusion. In the Christian tradition, the Greek word agape translates as unconditional love. This is large love that includes all and works with it all. This is not to say that most religious practitioners achieve this standard, but it is the level of liberation that one aspires to. In most cases, I hate to say, our ideas about love do not match our actions in the everyday world of ambition, competition, and complications. Even when we think we are acting in a loving manner, if we look closely, there are still limitations or conditions attached to it, spoken or unspoken. To love is to have no conditions attached. Love stands alone. This is agape love. This is unconditional love. You trust and rely on the efficacy of love. It's the most effective life strategy in both the short run and the long run. Even when results appear to be questionable, you step back from your own expectations and trust the larger process. If our love is conditional, its shortcomings will be evident. It leaves space for anger, resentment, and negativity to emerge. When you find yourself experiencing these types of emotions, it's a warning signal that your love has conditions attached to it that you were not aware of. This insight itself can sometimes be enough to activate your higher self, a self that is not as attached to its own opinions, a self that is not as insecure and neurotic, a self that is large enough to include more and more. A self that rejects less and less because now we can see the closer connections to everything. Unconditional love does not mean you no longer have a personal opinion. It simply means that you can listen to and include someone else's opinion without getting as upset as you did before. You have your opinion, they have theirs. Unconditional love does not mean you can't change things. You speak your mind, and you offer your advice, but it's okay if nothing changes, or even if it gets worse. <coughs> you have done your part, and you haven't added to the problem by adding anger or impatience. Large love is a non-dual approach to polarization. Instead of identifying totally with one side and resisting the other, a non-dual approach includes both. 
there are still two distinct sides, with two opposing positions, but you are creatively engaged with both. You may choose to identify with one side, but you are not personally attached to the one and adverse to the other. You have transcended both sides, included them both in your approach. But your personal identity is not wrapped up in either one. There is something larger than both of these. Love. Ram Das, a 60s American guru who wrote the bestseller Be Here Now, tells a story about he and his teacher, Neem Karola. This comes from his 2013 book, Polishing the Mirror. In those early days of being with Maharaji, he would tell me repeatedly, Ram Das, love everyone and tell the truth. It's all one. Just love everyone. See God everywhere. Don't get angry. Just love everyone and tell the truth. You know, when people say things like that to you, you say, yeah, sure. And it sort of goes through you like Chinese food, because you've been told that since you were in Sunday school. At the time, I could only touch that place for occasional moments. I was living most of the time on the ego level. I could love almost everyone for short periods of time, but the truth was that I did not love everyone. There was one day when I was so angry with everyone at the ashram, and Maharaji came up to me, nose to nose, looked me in the eye and said, Ram Das, love everyone and tell the truth. Don't be angry. He was telling me to take a different approach. He was saying, when I can relate from the soul plane of consciousness, which is who I really am, I will love everyone. That is my truth. It's only taken me 40 years to figure it out. So here are four tips on how to relate to someone who disagrees with you, or subtitled, A Non-Dual Approach to Polarization. Tip number one, listen closely. It does no harm to listen closely to what someone is saying. It doesn't mean you're going to agree with them, but it does mean you are trying to understand their point of view and their life experience. It means you will gain a better understanding of who they are and why they feel like they do. Who knows? Perhaps you will learn something. And you may have noticed this is our fifth agreement on the parlor wall hanging, be skeptical, but learn to listen closely. Tip number two, remain calm. Notice what emotions are arising. Identify them if you can. Keep your mouth shut and remain calm. Continue to listen closely. Tip number one and allow the body and the mind to stay steady. If you're upset, don't get visibly upset. Maintain your composure and wait until the other person has finished talking. Tip number three, identify what you have in common. If you have calmly listened to the other person, surely there is something that the two of you can agree upon. This is the starting point. Establish what you share in common. They may be surprised to find themselves agreeing with you about something. And then introduce a new idea, perhaps, or perhaps not. If you sense they're not interested or open to discussing the idea in a non-argumentative fashion, then you may want to end the conversation right there. Having established something that you can agree on, and conducting the interaction in a positive manner more likely leads the opportunity for a future conversation. And tip number four, connect. 
This is the most important, and this is something that is 100% in your control. Even though there are two sides, and you may still disagree with the other person, at a deeper level, there is a non-dual oneness or a connection between the two of you. This is where large love or agape takes you. Unconditional love does not depend on me agreeing with you 100% of the time. It does not depend on anything that you may or may not do. It is simply love. It's a connection that nothing can inhibit or get in the way of. It simply is. As Ram Dass says, it is the soul plane of consciousness. And when you are in that state, when you speak, it is right speech. Respectful, civil, caring, but it can also challenge the narrative. There's nothing wrong with that. Negativity and hostility are what cut the connection. Polarization creates a distance that is difficult to bridge, and it is what keeps us apart even in times when we need each other the most. That is why these are times of compassion. These are the times when we cannot allow our differences to divide us or alienate us. These are times when we need connection, kindness, and tolerance. Large love is love without bias. No preference, no avoidance. Love that includes all the world, everyone and everything, good and evil, joy and suffering, peace and injustice. Nothing is included, nothing left out, all in all, everything as it is, for it will all change soon. In closing, a reading by Robert Fulcham from his book, All I Ever Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. The man next door and I look upon each other with suspicion. He's a raker and shoveler, as I see it, a troubler of the natural ways of the earth, left over from a breed that conquered the wilderness. He thinks of me in simpler terms, lazy. See, every week during the fall, he's out raking leaves into little piles. And every time it snows, he's out tormenting the white stuff with his shovel. Once, out of either eagerness or outrage, he even managed to shovel a heavy frost. Can't let old Mother Nature get ahead of you, says he. So I tell him he hasn't the sense God gave a stump. Get careful, you know. Leaves been falling down for thousands and thousands of years, I tell him. And the earth did pretty well for rakes and people. Old Mother Nature put leaves where she wanted them and they make more earth. We need more earth, I tell you. We're running out of it, I tell you. And snow, snow is not my enemy. Snow is God's way of telling people to slow down and rest and stay in bed for the day. And besides, snow, snow always solves itself. Mixes with the leaves to form more earth, I tell you. His yard does look neat, I must admit, if neatness is important. And he didn't fall down getting to his car last snowstorm, in fact, like I did. He is a good neighbor, even if he is a raker and a shoveler. I'm open-minded about this thing. Still, my yard has an oriental carpet of red and yellow, green and brown, and his doesn't. And I spent the same time he spent shoveling snow, collecting it in bottles to mix with orange juice in July. I gave him a bottle of vintage winter snow for Christmas, and he gave me a rake. We're giving each other lessons in the proper use of such tools. I think he's got no religion, and I'm trying to convert him. He thinks I've got too much, and he's trying to get me to back off. But in the end, in the end, in the final end of it all, if I win, he and I, even you, will become what the leaves and snow will become and go where the leaves and snow go, whether the rake 
or shovel or not. In these times of compassion, I encourage you to find ways to do kind things, to say helpful words, and find ways to assist those who could use a helping hand. Be compassionate on this day. Hold strong. Large love is our way. Closing words are by Martin Luther King Jr. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. So now, as we extinguish the chalice, may the blessing of truth be upon us, the power of love direct and sustain us, and may the peace of this community preserve our going out and are coming in from this time forth until we meet again. I want to thank you all for joining us for today's UU Holton Sunday service. Like and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Practice kindness, keep your attitudes positive, and look out for those having a difficult time. I want to thank our cameraman, Christophe morning for filming today's service and for Ben Carmichael at Board Barista for our production work. Have a good rest of your day everyone and we will see you next time.